Uh, when I was growing up, I read a lot of uh, biographies and autobiographies. You know, I was fascinated by a lot of uh, historical figures. The computer field was quite young, uh, but already uh, there were people like Ken Olson, uh, Gordon Bell, uh, who'd done incredible work. Well, I'm amazed by this museum, the Computer History Museum. I like the history. Even before my time, machines that I had barely heard of, actually going and seeing what they look like, physical sizes, and looking at some of the nomenclature on the switches and thinking about the people that used them. The semiconductor industry has made bigger changes in a few decades than printing has over a few centuries. This industry, more than any other perhaps, is about the future. It also wants to hold on to its heritage. We are recording the events of history contemporaneously with them happening. Rarely in history do you have a chance to do that. Wouldn't you love to be able to hear Michelangelo talk about what it was like to paint the Sistine Chapel? This is a remarkable place. You know, I support the heck out of it. I really think it's uh, an important thing. That's what a museum is about, is being able to understand the history of, what one, of what's been happening and, and to see it and feel it. I think a lot of new younger people would come to the Computer History Museum and see some of the work that I did, some of our machines, and look back, Wow, look how they started with such simple little things and that led to today. So those are our rock stars. Those are the fellows and the personalities of the Computer History Museum, or at least some of them. We have um, hundreds of oral histories in our archive, and as you heard Lynn say at the beginning, that is a very important part of what we do. And what you'll see us doing more and more in the future is producing this very rich archive into stories and threads and themes that tell the history of the computing industry in a way that's really vibrant and inspirational. I think of this museum as a great public institution, and great public institutions have certain qualities in common. When I think about this museum, I think of those qualities. I think you can hear it in the voices of the people that we've just seen. It has a crusading spirit. It's founded on a big idea. It serves as a monument to innovation and creative thinking. It honors men and women who've literally changed the world. It tells their stories, often their very personal and very compelling stories, and you're going to hear three of those tonight. And this museum preserves and presents the technology that those men and women have brought forth to accomplish really extraordinary things. So at a moment in history we, when we could use a few more of those heroes and we could hear a few more of those stories, we are especially proud to host this 2008 Fellow Awards evening. Our trustees have built an exceptional foundation here, and I believe we can build further on that. In fact, I believe that we can make the Computer History Museum one of the truly great museums of the 21st century. We can model, we can inspire, and we can lead. So my hope for us, therefore, is very simple. It was put into words by the American historian Daniel Borston years ago when he wrote about the Quaker immigrants who came to America. He said, they came to America to do good, and they also did well. As I prepared to introduce Robert Krulwich tonight, I realized that our careers have intersected from time to time with these kinds of institutions. We both got started in media at great publicly-minded organizations. He got his started in PR. I got mine at PBS. We both then spent a number of years in commercial media, both chasing, uh, what is it they call it, filthy lucre. <laughs> and while I can't speak for Robert, I suspect we both ran into a lot more filth than we did lucre. <laughs> but he's still with ABC, so I hope you're doing better on one end of it than you are the other, Robert. And we are now both back in areas that we really love, uh, which are great publicly minded institutions again. 
know, when I was in public broadcasting, <clears throat> and my good friend Jeff Clark, who's the CEO of KQED, is here with us tonight. I think he's probably had the same thing happen to him. I would often meet somebody on a plane or in an airport, and as you do, you'd start talking about your job and what you did, and often they would say, I would say I was with PBS, and they would say, oh, I love PBS, I just love it. And then frequently they'd say, I listen to that every morning when I drive into work. <laughs> so at that moment, you know, it never really worked to say, well, PBS is TV and NPR is radio and there are different organizations and there are different staffs, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, the only thing that mattered is that people loved it and that's what counts. So <laughs> Robert Krulwich is one of the people who makes that love affair happen. He is one of the most erudite, understandable, and credible people working in any media of any kind. His beat is science and technology, but his art is taking the complicated and making it understandable. Now notice that I didn't say simple. He takes technology and science and he explains it, and he explains it really well, but he does not do it by dumbing it down. So, Robert, I don't know if you have Joe the Plumber in mind on your average day, <clears throat> but if you do, I'm sure he appreciates you, and I hope he's a member of his local NPR station, too. So, Robert works at the crossroads of science and technology, but as his bio says, he's also there with culture and politics and religion. Now, that is a very busy crossroads, but he directs the traffic like almost nobody else. He has brought knowledge into our homes for years on CBS and ABC and PBS. He's now back in radio on the science desk at NPR in New York. He's won just about every award on the planet for reporting with integrity and honesty and knowledge. And I feel very, very lucky that we were able to lure Robert from New York to Silicon Valley tonight to host this ceremony. So. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming one of the best there's ever been in technology and science reporting, Robert Krulwich. When, when you do what I do, I try to talk about complex things on TV and radio, it's, it's always a good first step, I think, to at least imagine what is already in your audience's head. What cliches are out there? What does the audience already think it knows? And I think when you think about technology in this, and the computing industry, there's obviously a very rich folk image, the Silicon Valley story, that they tell not only in America, they tell it all over the world. It, it usually begins with one or two young entrepreneurs, innovator, geeky types with glasses and stuff, and they're always young. They're usually a little playful, the Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak kind of thing, where they call up the Pope with a jerry-rigged phone using a whistle from Captain Crunch kind of people. Um, <laughs> Uh, a little bit of the outlaw, you know, perhaps. Um, they always have a garage. Um, it, it's sort of a set piece, like in a ballet, a pas de deux, a trio. You know, it, one night, they disappear into the garage, and then there is a silence, and then in that silence, something brilliant happens, always out of view, and then they come out of the garage, and they have a, a something uh, that's always smaller than whatever was there before, a little more compact than whatever was there before, a little faster than whatever was there before, always faster, always more useful than whatever was there before. It was, it's an obviously, why didn't I think of that kind of usefulness? Uh, and then, uh, with a little bit of glue and a soldering iron, the, the two p geeky people make a prototype. Was it? And then a year or two passes, and suddenly they have one million, ten million, or a hundred million dollars. And it's... Uh, <laughs> It's the Wilbert and Orville Wright story, just, you know. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. And it's also an only in America story. And to be fair, I don't know, sometimes this must have happened somewhere, I guess. But tonight we are going to celebrate three people who made it, as best as I can tell, garagelessly. No garage. <laughs> um, none of them is an overnight wunderkind. And while they display a spirit that you might associate with America, they are not all Americans. One of them, having been born and done his early and important work in Helsinki, would not qualify as an American, though he came here later. But all three of them, and they're having a very good time at their table with more bottles than anyone else. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a BYO group over there, and I got to get it. Um, but all three of them, and you're going to see this in the videos from their oral histories, all three of the honorees do share this, a crazy sense of can-do, 
of optimism that says, well, I can be a young lady in Alanthus Grove, Missouri, graduating from a teacher's college, and thinking, I don't really want to teach math. Uh, so what else am I supposed to do? And she thinks about it, and her first job is, of course, at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, uh, figuring the trajections of incoming shells and missiles with an extraordinarily primitive computer. I mean, why not? And um, <laughs> another one decides to hook up uh, information systems in a new and very cool way so that more people in more places can share more information much more quickly, increasing speed and ubiquity and access, an idea that comes not out of a garage, but out of a kind of why not sort of mindset and somebody who, who opens programming to a whole world of users for free, challenging and defying old architectures and corporate hierarchies and symbolized by the Linux logo, which is a happy penguin with a really fat little belly that looks like he's just <laughs> gobbled up all the sardines in the ocean. <laughs> the thing is, these three honorees seem to have had a really good time. And what drove them when they were young was not necessarily a desire to make millions, although there's nothing, you know, not anything wrong with that. Uh, not by an outlaw spirit, although I, I, I seem to have no problems breaking a few eggs, but from the beginning, they seemed mostly determined not to be bored, not to do what was easy or obvious, same old, same old. And when you see these interviews in a few minutes, you're gonna see mostly a whole lot of joy. They just liked doing what they did. They weren't bothered that it hadn't been done, and that it couldn't be done, that it shouldn't be done, that it was a fool's dream, that it wouldn't work. They just did it. And because they did it, they got these smiles. And tonight, when you see them close up in the video, you're going to see three big, fat, why not, let me try, I can do this, smiles. So that's what we're celebrating tonight, three people who are still smiling. So, our... Uh, I'm going to sit with you guys down there at table eight, whatever it is. Our first honoree is, is Jean Bartik. Uh, Jean Bartik is one of the original six progr programmers uh, for the ENIAC computer and is thus one of the first computer programmers in the world. Born on December 27, 1924 as Betty Jean Jennings in Missouri, she attended Northwest Missouri State Teachers College. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics. She earned a Master of Science in English from the University of Pennsylvania and an Honorary Doctor of Science from Northwest Missouri State University. In 1945, she was hired to compute ballistics firing tables at the Army's Ballistic Research Labs as one of 80, uh, they call them computers, these are people, usually women, hired to calculate ballistic trajectories by hand. Also in 1945, a novel electronic machine to compute firing tables called ENIAC was completed. ENIAC was over 700 square feet in size, had 18,000 vacuum tubes, tubes, and weighed 30 tons. The female engineers selected to work on the ENIAC had no programming manuals, no classes. Jean and the team taught themselves the operation system from its logical and electrical block diagrams and then figured out how to program it. They wrote the program and placed it on the ENIAC using, it's written here, a challenging physical interface. <laughs> which had hundreds of wires and 3,000 switches. In 1947, Jean became part of the group charged with converting the ENIAC into a stored program computer, a major milestone that made it easier to use by reducing problem setup time from weeks to hours. She also went on to contribute to the development of BINAC and UNIVAC-1. She then became an editor for Our Back Publishers. This is an early publisher in the high-tech sector. And in 1981, she, she joined Data Decisions as a senior editor for communication services. She was inducted into the Hall of Fame in Technology, Hall of Fame Women in Technology International, along with the other original ENIAC programmers, and in 2001, her alma mater renamed its computer museum in her honor. Jean has been honored by the Army Research Labs, the University of Pennsylvania, and each of the fellows tonight contributed their story by sitting down with the museum to just talk. So I want you to watch now this is, it's very cool. Uh, this is an excerpt from Jean's story. To program, one plugged in cables and set switches. In the foreground, Betty Jennings is programming the master programmer, which combined the subroutines set up on the local units into a single master routine. In the public demonstration of the ENIAC, we computed the trajectory of a shell that took 30 seconds to reach its target. A young woman with a mechanical desk calculator
spent one or two days calculating such a trajectory. The ENIAC computed the trajectory in only 20 seconds, faster than the shell itself traveled. This convinced the colonels and generals present that electronic computers were important. I come from a long line of school teachers and farmers, and I was born in Gentry County, Missouri, about two miles outside a little town called Alanthus Grove. I love college. I mean, I went when I was 16, and the first time I'd ever been away from home, and I absolutely loved it. I was uh, finished with my coursework in January of 1945, so my calculus teacher, I had said to my calculus teacher, I don't want to teach school, what a, but I can't think of anything else to do. And she said, oh, there are lots of things you can do. So she began to bring me uh, recruitment letters. So she brought me from one, one from IBM for system service girls, and she brought me one from Aberdeen Proving Ground for computers. I applied, and uh, I didn't hear from them. Finally, when it came, it said that I was hired in Tacoma as soon as possible. Yeah, I was on the Wabash out of Stanbury the next night. I was just sitting there calculating these trajectories to go into firing table for guns, and uh, each uh, firing table had about a thousand trajectories, a thousand to 1,200, and uh, it took about 40 hours, 30 to 40 hours to do one by hand. So they had a lot of them to do. This announcement came around that they were looking for operators and of a new machine they were building called the ENIAC. So of course I had no idea what it was. But uh, I knew it wasn't doing hand calculations. <laughs> so I figured that if I could start on the ground floor with other people, then I'd have a chance to get ahead. So I, I applied. You know, I don't think they ever really thought that we would be programmers. I think the, the original view of it was that anybody that had a problem to put on the ENIAC that uh, they would program it themselves and then just give it to us and we would plug up the machine and run it. They were going to have a public announcement of the ENIAC. Goldstein invited Betty and me out to his uh, and his wife, Adele was there, to his apartment and he asked us if the ENIAC, if the trajectory was ready to go and if they could use it as a demonstration for the announcement on the 15th. Well, Betty and I were pretty sure it was perfect. So we said, you bet. <laughs> when they ran the trajectory uh, for, the, uh, for the demonstration, the um, uh, trajectory that they ran took 30 seconds for the shell to trace it, but the ENIAC did the calculations in 20 seconds. The people that were sitting there could see the numbers build up as the, as the shell reached the altitude and then came down and hit the ground. So that was pretty impressive. We went out to the tabulator and printed them up and handed them out as souvenirs for people. Yeah, we ran it several times, you know, to show people, you know, exactly what was going on. Uh, so, I mean, they were absolutely ecstatic. Well, they went out to, for dinner with all the people, but guess what? Not the Antioch women. Betty and I weren't invited. So, <laughs> we were sort of horrified. Then after years, I mean, nobody paid any attention to the Antioch women until 1986. Uh, Catherine Kleiman, who um, was graduating from Harvard with a degree in social science, and uh, she had chosen as her senior paper the women in the computer business. Tom Petzanger, who wrote, wrote the upfront column, and the Wall Street Journal on Fridays. 
heard about us. He wrote two columns in the Wall Street Journal. Then everybody was interested in us. I think you should do what you love. It's, it's not that much work when you do what you like to do. But when you're doing what you don't like to do, it's really drudgery. So I believe that you really should, should move on if you don't enjoy doing it because life's too short not to enjoy what you're doing. The other one, of course, is luck beats brains. <laughs>
From 1990 to 2000, Bob wrote a weekly internet column in InfoWorld, collected in his book, Internet Collapses. And in 2001, Bob joined Polaris Venture Partners, a venture capital firm in Boston, Massachusetts. Bob's internet pioneering earned him many honors, including the ACM Grace Murray Hopper Award, the IEEE Medal of Honor, and the National Medal of Technology, an induction into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. So let's take a look, brief look at Bob's oral history interview. Take an office, any office will do. No matter what its product or service, whether it be located in a business, a government agency, or in a medical or educational facility, the basic work of that office, the product of its employees' efforts, is information. Call it a paper explosion, or data overload, or asset mismanagement. The bottom line is the same. The ultimate product of the office, information, is out of control. What's needed is not a new system, but a new concept. A way to take the office as it is and make it something it has never been. An interactive network. This is the Ethernet cable, a passive carrier capable of accepting transmissions from various kinds of office machines and terminals and carrying them at millisecond speed to designated destinations. In eighth grade, I was asked to do a science project, and so I decided to build a computer. There would be a row of toggle switches labeled 1 through N, and another row of toggle switches labeled 1 through N, and then a, a row of neon lights left over from the train set. When you click the switches, you could hear the relays all settling down and displaying the results. So my science teacher uh, called it, he was the one who called it a computer instead of an adding machine. I was going to be in I was going to go to MIT and get a degree in electrical engineering because I owed it to my fourth grade teacher. I loved MIT from the very beginning. Pressure I loved. And there was competition and um, we worked very hard and did problem sets into the night, lots of all-nighters. My interest was in the computer side of things, operations research and modeling and uh, systems dynamics. And when I went to Harvard in applied math, it was the computer side of applied math, and then I finally got my PhD in computer science. The ARPANET, Internet 1.0, as I like to call it, was just getting started as a thing that graduate students got funded to do. So I said, hey, I just learned, I just graduated from MIT uh, learning how to um, program uh, d digitally design things, why don't I design the interface to connect the PDP-10 to the IMP? And Harvard said, that's too important for a graduate student to do. We're going to get a company to do it. So I turned around and went down the street to um, Project Mac, uh, now known as CSAIL at MIT. There were some openings, and I said, I want to, you have an IMP, and you have a PDP-6, and then a PDP-10 later. I'd like to put those together. MIT said, okay, we'll give you a job. Your job is to connect our IMP to our PDP-6. Anyway, that got me started in the high-speed network interface business. I went to Xerox Park because they offered me more money than anyone else. The research center was new and spiffy and full of really interesting people like Butler Lampson and Alan Kay. And I was going to be the network guy. So I s said yes. Oh, and I'd always wanted to go to California. Little did I know that Palo Alto was really far from the ocean and the beaches there, the water's really cold. In those days, Route 128 was the entrepreneurship capital of the world. This was the hot area and I was leaving it to go to the beach, basically. On May 22, 1973, I wrote a memo uh, in which Ethernet was named. And in that memo, I renamed it the Ethernet with a capital N and a space, Ether Space Net. I met a guy from Intel who was wandering around NBS looking for applications for a new PMOS, PMOS process that Intel had. And I followed up with him in Santa Clara and met Andy Grove and said, gee, why don't you take your new PMOS chip and make an Ethernet chip with it? And here I've got DEC and Xerox talking. Why don't you join us and we will make this Ethernet standard, which is why I founded 3Com on June 4, 1979, for the purpose of serving the Ethernet-compatible market 
that was sure to develop from the cooperation among DEC, Intel, and Xerox. So 3Com was a slightly generalized notion of the Ethernet, serve the Ethernet compatible market. 3Com was computer communication compatibility. In August of 81, IBM had introduced its personal computer. And it seemed, my sense of it was, that it was catching on. So what I did is I bought one. And I um, put it on a table right outside the engineering department's cubicles. Of course, the engineers, they all came out and started looking at this thing, this, uh, this IBM PC. And before I knew it, it was open. And, and there was a card, an option slot. It was this big. And our guys are looking at it and looking at it. And, you know, we could do that. So we shipped in uh, September of 1982 the first uh, Ethernet for the IBM PC called the Etherlink. It would be an understatement to say the product sold well. We lucked out. The IBM PC caught on. And, um, and the channel of distribution appropriate for us also caught on. So much to our good fortune, computer retailing started. And it was that channel of distribution combined with our product, combined with the sex success of the IBM PC, our numbers just took off. Our products worked, but our customers said, yeah, your products work just like you said, but they're not very useful. Well, that's devastating. Why aren't they useful? So I drew a graph, and the graph had number of nodes on the network along the bottom and dollars vertical. And the cost of the network was a straight line. It went up $1,000 per node like this. But what's the value of the network? Well, the value of the network must have something to do with the number of nodes that you can connect to from your PC. N. And then each node has that value. That is, it can talk to n other no n minus one other nodes, and there's n of those. So the total value of the whole network is n times n minus one, which is approximately n squared, and that becomes a quadratic line. It goes like this, and there's this point out there where the linear and the quadratic cross. And so for small n, the value is below the cost, and then there's a critical mass point. And then above that, the value greatly exceeds the cost and gets better all the time, network effect. So we went back to our customers. We gave them a reason why they weren't useful. You have not achieved critical mass. That reason seemed plausible. Wouldn't you know, we started selling $30,000 networks to these people. George Gilder started working on a book that ultimately was named Telecosm. It was a follow-on to his earlier book called Microcosm. Microcosm, I believe, is the book in which Moore's Law was touted. I and mean, he interviewed me, and he asked me for a bunch of stuff, and I showed him my you know, artifacts. And he saw this slide showing the straight line and the quadratic with the critical mass point. And he said, that's Metcalfe's law. Technological innovation is the source of all progress. So you should be in the technological innovation business, at the core of which is science and engineering. That's the highest calling is to be in technological innovation. Democracy, freedom, prosperity, they all stem from technological innovation. And the world needs more of us. One of the big problems in the world today is energy. The world needs cheap and clean energy. Cheap and clean, not just cheap, not just clean, but cheap and clean energy. The world needs it. Too many of the people who have noticed it are Luddites and Greens and Marxists and politicians and lawyers and people who are in no position to solve the problem. However, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists, we can solve the problem. So just like it took us 30 years to break the back of the communication monopolies and build the internet, we are going to take the next 30 years to break the back of the uh, energy monopolies and meet the world's needs for clean and cheap energy. Well, there's a very bashful man, don't you think? Oh. Tonight we are celebrating Bob's fundamental contributions in the invention, stand, invention, standardization, and commercialization of the Ethernet. So let's bring him up onto the stage. Linus 
Torvalds created the, <clears throat> the Linux kernel and managed open source development of widely used Linux operating system, um, Linus was born on December 28th, 1969, as I mentioned before, in Helsinki, Finland. He enrolled at the University of Helsinki in 1988, graduating with a master's degree in computer science. His thesis was titled, Linux, a Portable Operating System. We don't have the Finnish uh, actual version of the title. And <laughs> an avid computer programmer, um, Linus authored many gaming applications in his early years. After purchasing a personal computer with an Intel 386 CPU, he began using Minix, a Unix-inspired operating system created by Andrew Tannenbaum for use as a teaching tool. Linus started work on a new kernel and then later to be named uh, Li Linux. See, this is, the vowels here are very intricate and interesting. <laughs> In the fall of 1991, after forming a team of volunteers to work on his new kernel, he released version 1.0 in the spring of 1994. In 1996, Linus accepted an invitation to visit the California headquarters of Transmeta, a startup company. In the first stages of designing an energy-saving central processing unit, Linus then accepted a position at Transmeta and moved to California. Along with his work for Transmeta, Linus continued to oversee kernel development for Linux. In 2003, Linus left Transmeta to focus exclusively on the Linux kernel, backed by Open Source Development Labs, a consortium of high-tech companies, which included IBM, Hewlett Packard, Intel, AMD, Red Hat, Novell, and many others. The purpose of the consortium was to promote Linux development. The Open Source Development Labs merged with Free Standards Group in 2007 to become the Linux Foundation. Linus remains the ultimate authority on all new code incorporated into the standard Linux kernel. <laughs> Linus is a passionate advocate of open source software development and has watched Linux, Linux, Linux develop from a hobbyist project <laughs> to a computing platform widely adopted by business, industry, and government. And now, let's have an excerpt from Linus's story. I basically wanted to be a scientist. I mean, that was what my grandfather had done to me. It was, if you're interested in, in computers and math, and your biggest like, idols are scientists, that it was very obvious that I wanted to go to university. And Helsinki University was the largest university in Finland, and it was right mm. there, so there was no real even, I mean, there was no choice. People really thought it was pretty odd that Linux came out of Helsinki University. It was not what they were teaching. It was not what people were kind of expected to do. So, so it, Helsinki University was a great place, but it didn't have the culture of, of doing operating system research. I ordered Minix. It was kind of the companion to Andrew Tannenbaum's book. So. So you wouldn't actually go to a computer store to get Minix, you would actually go to a bookstore. But even after I had Unix on the machine, remember what I actually wanted to do was play with the, with the CPU itself. So what I ended up doing, I just wrote my own programs to boot off a floppy with no OS at all, because having the OS in between me and the CPU was against the whole point of the exercise. And I realized, okay, it was fine for getting to really know the low-level CPU stuff, and it was fine for the small things I needed to do. But if I wanted to expand it and actually do a file system and do things like save and, and uh, uploading to the university, and I started working on trying to reorganizing the thing so that it was acted more like a real operating system. For six months, I'd worked alone on this thing pretty much full time, and, and it was not usable for anybody. I think in September or something like that, I actually had my first version where 
the definition of what the first ver version was. I could actually run something under it. The other thing I've been good at, because I don't care, is the letting go part. It's too easy to try to be controlling. It's been an evolution. In fact, it's been one of the biggest things that has been evolving is just how you work together with people across the globe. It started out slow um, and, uh, and on a very small scale. Sometimes they said, this is wrong, right? And sent a patch to fix it. More often they just sent, this is wrong and didn't say, send a patch, but they at least told me why it was wrong, which is almost equally useful. And uh, it actually took a while before I learned to just trust people. It went to the point where I would trust some people so much that I would just say, okay, when they send me a patch, I worked with them now long enough that I would say, okay, this guy really, I, he knows how I work, I know how he works, I'll just apply it. A number of people felt that, okay, since we have this wild and crazy name of open source and being university students and, and things like that, the logo should be really corporate and state to kind of balance it out. They used to do these commercials for British TV using clay animation. And one of them had this fat penguin. And that was kind of, I saw that. Somebody sent me a picture of that. And I saw that and I say, okay, that's more like it. So I basically said, okay, what we want is this cartoonish penguin sitting down fat, gorged and herring, and just very happy and cuddly. I'm really happy about the fact that my job is my hobby, right? Mm -hmm. Or my hobby is my job, however you want to put it, right? And, uh, and the fact that what I do is not just fun to do, but it also seems to be meaningful. So it's, it actually matters to other people. And if you have those two things, I think you'll be happy, whatever you do. Tonight, we honor Linus for the creation of the Linux kernel and the management of open source development and the widely used Linux operating system. and congratulations to all three editions of the Computer History Museum's Hall of Fellows. Let's take the opportunity to show collectively now our congratulations for the whole gang. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the program back over to John Holler for uh, closing remarks. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite Bob Metcalf back to the stage, who's going to say a few words on behalf of the class of 2008. Bob? On behalf of the uh, class of uh, 2008, which would include uh, Linus and Gene and, and me and Jimmy Buffett, <laughs> I'd like to thank the uh, Computer History Museum and all of you for coming to this big party. Linus says that he is terminally shy, and that's why he's not uh, speaking at this moment. And he wanted me to be sure that you understood that he works with thousands of people, and he'd like to thank those thousands of people. And uh, it's his job to get the glory here tonight, but it's on behalf of those thousand people, and so he shyly, shyly thanks all of you. Jean, on the other hand, is not shy. <laughs> and she, wanted, she expresses often and wanted me to express that she loved and enjoyed her time with the six ENIAC women, and particularly with the technical Camelot that was Eckert and Mockley Computer Corporation. Jean uh, does not work. It's not, it wasn't work. It was fun. 
and she happily says thank you to the Computer History Museum and to all of you for coming here tonight. As for me, considering how annoying I have been all these years, <laughs> I'm grateful for the uh, opportunity to come here tonight and party with you all. In fact, that's what I miss about living in Boston, is all these great parties that we have in Silicon Valley. And any, any excuse for a party, that's my motto. <laughs> Especially if it's a good excuse, a good excuse like the Computer History Museum. So, okay, I promise, now that I'm a fellow, that I'm going to try every day to be less annoying. <laughs> so, so on behalf of the class of uh, 2008, thank you to the Computer History Museum and to all of you for this, uh, for the honor and joy of this evening's festive gala event. Thank you.